is it cold outside? My dog thinks so. I, let, I went to let him out this morning, and he just looked at me like, you go out there. <laughs> every nation and tribe, every tongue. I, thought, I was thinking about that as we were singing that song about um, that that is so true, that there are Christians all around the world um, today on their, on their Sunday, whenever they can meet to worship, that are praising God with us. We can get so caught up in our own little enclave that we forget that there is a much broader kingdom of God that's just wonderful. I was just thinking about that, something that we can praise the Lord for and rejoice in because of our own um, partnership with so many organizations that reach the lost for Christ. And that is such a, um, a wonderful thing that we're involved in. Uh, last week, we were looking at Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through 14, and we talked about the fact that we are no longer debtors of the flesh, that we were to put, us, put, to, deed, uh, put to death the deeds of the flesh because we are sons of God. This week, if you will turn with me to Romans 8, chapter chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, we're going to continue this discussion about who we are in Christ. As we saw, the, the whole book of Romans is really about the gospel, about the gospel being taken to the world. And so everything that Paul talks about revolves around that aspect of our doctrine, the fact that we are in Christ. So we start off this passage this morning with these words. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. I started thinking about that this last week in terms of the issue of slavery and the imagery of slavery, the picture of slavery in the New Testament, in the Scriptures. And because we have we, we, we do not, we don't any longer are a slave to sin, and so we have been enslaved to something prior to our slavery to Christ. So what is that imagery? Well, Paul says in Galatians 4.3 that we were once enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Of course, what are those principles? In the context of Galatians, Paul is talking about the Judaizers who came in and we're telling the Christians to be real Christians, you needed to be obedient and to obey the law of Moses. And so Paul is talking about these elementary principles, this elementary idea that somehow we have the ability to work and to please God. When in reality, we can't please God by anything that we do because we will always fail Him. We are all sinners, the Scripture says. So this idea of performance that I can do well in order to please God can become a, a cycle in which we are enslaved to. I work hard to become obedient so that God will love me more. I fail. I, I feel guilty so I work harder to please God more. And I fail and I become a slave to this, this cycle of, of works and performance. And if we're stuck in it, we are miserable of all people because we'll never be able to achieve that goal of pleasing God through our efforts. And so Paul says you were once enslaved to this, enslaved to it in such a way that, that you, and it led to, led to death. He also says that in Romans 6.19 that we were slaves to impurity. Now, this idea of impurity and purity from the Old Testament um, it has a different aspect to it than we typically think about. Um, it could also be translated clean or unclean, these two words in the Old Testament. But it's not about dirt or filth in that way. It's not even about a moral issues or sexuality in terms of impureness. It is rather uh, an issue about a fitness to be in the presence of God. If you were impure, you couldn't go to worship at the temple. 
There were two sources of impurity, that which came from the outside, such as if I were in contact with something dead and I touched it, then I would be impure. It also came from the inside, such as the secretions of bodily fluids. That would make me impure, and I would not be able to go and worship the Lord. The transmission of impurity could be by touch, if I touch something, but it could also be in the proximity. And that's why the people who had leprosy would constantly yell out, unclean, unclean, because if you were even in their proximity, it could cause you to be unclean, and you would not be able to um, worship in the temple. The rules had become so complex and there were different levels of impurity and severity and even the ability to become clean was difficult. So they were becoming slaves to these rules, slaves to these uh, cleansing rules that if we could just become clean, we could be, uh, be able to be in God's presence. When actually the purity laws in the Old Testament were really to show us that we are always unclean and really always have the inability to come before God. And we couldn't become clean unless we came to Christ. Titus says that we were slaves to various passions. Interestingly, if you Google the rules for passion, you will come up with either three to ten rules in order to have passion. They all, they all center around this idea of self-achievement or self-gratification. But Titus says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So in Titus, it could be translated lusts. But it doesn't have the sexual overtones that we tend to give it, and rather it is this over-obsession with something. We can lust for power, we can lust for wealth, we can lust for possessions. And in that obsession of things, or position, or wealth, we become slaves to it, because it becomes our purpose and meaning in life. Also in Titus, he tells the women, he says, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Paul also writes that we should not be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're slaves to wine, it's about drunkenness. But drunkenness is really a coping me a mechanism to either numb pain in our life or to somehow gain control when we feel out of control. Alcoholics and addictions fall into those, those categories because even though it becomes something that is difficult to get out of, it always starts with a choice and we become a slave to it if we choose to follow in, fall, fall after it. Paul then says in Romans 16 that we were slaves to sin. That's kind of this overarching um, category that it is an a willful act against God. When we choose to do something that the Scripture says do not do, and we willfully do it, we are slaves to sin. An example of that is, is that Paul says is that even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give Him thanks. So it's not about whether you know God or not, because even if you know God, you can choose to act willfully against what He desires. And then we become slaves to sin. Because oftentimes when we get caught up in sin like this, instead of going to God in repentance, what we do is we resign to the fact that we are fallen people and we continue in it and become slaves to it. Paul, in Romans 6.16, 6, defines for us what it means to be a slave. He says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So it's, the question is, is what do we obey? Do we, we obey that which is sinful or that which is a righteous before God? And whichever one we choose to obey shows who we belong to. Now in our passage, he says, you have not received a spirit of slavery in order to fall back into fear. 
Now, this idea of fall back is really, uh, it, it implies certain things. It implies we were once someplace, because you can't fall back to someplace you've never been. It implies movement from something to something else, in which we have been slaves to something, and now we have moved forward. And the question is, are we falling back? And it kind of gives this idea of the backslidden Christian. And there's a lot of debate over whether Christians really backslide or whether they're just, or, or whether they were Christians at all or whatever. But Paul says here, he says, you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back to fear. And so we are not to do that. Now, this idea of receive is not a passive statement. In other words, if I'm at home and the mailman comes and he, he leaves a package, I've received that package. And I've, it's kind of a passive reception. This is an act of reception. It is something that I have actively taken. So Paul is saying you have not actively taken a, a position of slavery to sin. You have not done that. So do not fall back into that fear because you have not taken that position of slavery. In other words, he says, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Whatever you're doing, stop doing it because you have not, been, you have not taken this position of slavery into sin. Instead, he says, but you have received the spirit. You have actively taken the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So what, once we, what we have not taken is a, is a spirit of slavery, but what we have received, what we have actively taken, is the spirit of adoption as sons. It's an act of taking. Now this idea of sonship, it goes to um, the idea of adoption in the, in the first century world. Especially Paul is talking to Romans, and in Rome there was a, a, this idea of adoption was enculturated. It was very prominent there. It was different than our adoption in this way. We tend to adopt children because we, we look at disenfranchised children, we go, man, I want to give them a home. Or I want to love a child uh, because maybe I can't have them, so I'm going to adopt them for their benefit. That wasn't the case in Rome. It really, even though there was a familiar relationship with the children that were adopted, it really had nothing to do with the child himself. It was a, contra, a, a culture and social context in terms of, I need someone to carry on my name legally. In fact, what would happen oftentimes, if a family didn't have um, a, a, a child and they would get into an age where they were probably going to die, they would often adopt their most trusted servant and then they would become part of the family and carry on the name of that family. And they would then receive all the property that that family had. It was a legal process in Rome. Now what would happen is, is that if you were to adopt a child, whether it be a, a child, a baby, or an adult, because that often happened as well, they would write a fictional story to um, bring that child out of their biological family and into their adopted family. So they would rewrite the history of the child so that it becomes a part of the whole family. Adoption was crucial in the role of matters of, of inheritance and secession. Even the, the emperor, the, the Roman emperor, would oftentimes adopt a child if he didn't have any of his own to help pass the empire over to them in a peaceful way. And of course, lastly, there was a philosophical influence. The Stoic philosophy was very prominent during that time, and it believed in the brotherhood of mankind. And so they liked the idea of adoption because it took it out of the biological family and put it into the larger family of mankind. And so here we have received a spirit of adoption where God has taken us out of the world and adopted us into his family. He has brought us out of sin and given us righteousness so that we would be his son. Now, adoption is an interesting thing in itself, and, and of course, I've never gone through an adoption, but I have adopted a dog. So and it's a little different, but 
not in some ways, because you had to have references, and they called up the references, and they asked if you would be a good family for this dog. Our dog had, one of our dogs had died, and so I was on my way home and happened to be going by the Humane Society, which wasn't even close to our home. And I went in, Rebecca did not know I was doing this, and I went in, and um, there were all these dogs. You walk into these places, and these dogs are just yapping at you. Oh, take me, take me, and they're wagging their tail, and they're licking their hands and, and everything. And I found this one cage, and it had three dogs in it. There was three black labs, um, and two, two girls and a boy who had been picked up off the, off the road. They had been uh, buckshot and everything, and two of them had come up. But there was one, the female, who was sitting in the back, and she, you could just tell she was fearful. And that's the one I fell in love with. That's the one I fell in love with, and I wanted to adopt that dog. Out of all these dogs, all of them wanting to be adopted, I adopted this one. I chose this one out of all of these dogs. You see, in one sense, that's what God does. He looks at all these people, and he says, I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to adopt you. And he chooses you and offers you something, and you actively receive to become adopted into the family of God so that you are a son. You are a daughter of the king of the universe. Isn't that awesome? That's what you've received. That's what you have. And what it says is, is that you have been adopted as sons who cry out, Abba, Father. This term, Abba, Father, is an Aramaic term. It appears in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. Paul uses it in several different places. It means dad or daddy. It's an, in, an intimate form of the word father. It's what a child would say to their dad. And here, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, and he prays. He says, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. What's interesting is, is that no Jewish person at that time would have called God Abba. They would not have said that God was an intimate person in their lives. Because the significance of this with Jesus, is, it's showing the intimate relationship that God had with his son, Jesus. Galatians says, and because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into your hearts so that you would cry out, Dad, Father. Now the, the coupling of those two words, Abba and Father, shows the intimacy and the reverence. Because we don't want to be irreverent by calling God Abba, because we want to make sure that we still honor him as the God of the universe. And yet at the same time, when we talk about, do you have an intimate relationship with God? And we say, yes, he is my Abba, my dad. Now, for some of us, we may not really understood what that meant as a child. My dad was distant. My dad was not home often. So my picture of God when I became a Christian was like that. God was distant. God was not around. God just kind of took care of things and then let it go. And I had to learn what it meant to understand that God was a, an intimate father who wanted to have a close relationship with us. It was intimacy. He chose us. And he says, I want you to be my heir. He says, the spirit of himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Heirs. We are heirs, and he testifies with this. This, this word, bear witness, just means to testify. And so the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. It's a, it's a mystical uh, interaction between his spirit and our spirit. Now, in the Jewish context, as well as the Roman context, having someone to testify was an important part of the culture. A, test, a, a person who testified had to be someone who was honest, someone who was upright and just, and was credible. There was a religious context to it. Oftentimes, testifying had to do with the covenants that you made with God or with the gods in terms of the Roman Empire. 
It was witnesses were to verify that which was true. And that's why their character was so important. It was also a community aspect to it that the person who testified didn't do so just for their own reasons or the reasons of the person they were testifying to, but to show credibility for the community, to uphold the community, its integrity, its justice. And so the Spirit testifies, tells what's true with our spirit, with us, that we are children of God. I mean, Jesus had three things that testified for him. It says this in John 1, 7. He, John the Baptist, came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. John 5, 31 says, If I alone, this is Jesus speaking, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Luke 9, 35, and a voice came out of the clouds saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You see, the father testified for his son. Then John 10, 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. So there were three that bore witness. The Father bore witness. John the Baptist bore witness. Jesus' own works bore witness about him. The difference between those witnesses with Jesus and what the Spirit does for us is the Spirit is not testifying for, about us. He is testifying with us. He is testifying with us. He is standing alongside of us despite our our problems, despite our, our sin, despite who we are. He stands with us and is proud because he has adopted us as his children. Ever stand next to somebody who other people might look at with kind of those questioning eyes? My son, my middle son, came home one time and he, from college, his first year in college, with a mohawk. Shaved the side of the head, he's got this mohawk going on. And Rebecca was like, what? Because we got church tomorrow. What are people going to say? And she stood by him. She stood right next to him as proud as could be. This is my son. (laughs) And she wasn't going to let anybody think otherwise. You see, the Spirit stands with us, with these awkward moments that we have, these sinful things that we do. He's not standing outside of us going, yes, I want to talk about him. He is standing with us saying, this is my son, and I have chosen him, and he has actively received this gift that I have given. And it all goes to this fact that we had been slaves, and now we are heirs with Christ. We're children, and we're heirs of the kingdom. Because not all children were heirs in the Roman world or in the world at that time. Only the oldest one received it. But we are all joint heirs with Christ for the kingdom. He has called us, and we have actively received what he has given us. And as a result, he has made us co-heirs with Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin, to fall back into fear, which was a fear of God, a fear of retribution, a fear of judgment. We don't have that in Christ. We can stand secure in our relationship with him and cry out, Dad. Even when we don't know what's going on, we say, Dad, I don't understand. Help me to understand. Dad, I I don't know why I'm experiencing this. And he stands with us. Now Paul has went on and he said, look, because in order for you to receive this, we need to suffer with him. Now in Paul's context, a lot of that suffering had to do what people who would suffer as a result of the gospel, going out and sharing the gospel and receiving retribution as a result of that. But it goes beyond further than that as we suffer through life itself, as we wait patiently for his return. 
Even when we don't understand what's going on, we suffer with him because he suffered for us. And he stands with us and we with him as children of God, as heirs to the kingdom. That's who we are. And to act differently from that is to deny the reality of what God has given us. So that's why he says, you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back to sin or to fear. You've received something greater, deeper, better. Now walk in him. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because that's who you are. A son child of the king. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that in this moment, in this moment, no matter where we're at in this life, whether we are struggling with anxiety or depression or whether we're wrestling with illness and disease, whether we're, we're growing older and, and feeling the frailty of this life, whether we're in a great relationship or whether our kids are doing wonderful or, or whether we're just prospering because of your goodness to us, Father, we know that none of that is, is the result of your condemnation on us. It is because of your great love that we endure suffering. It's because of your great love we experience blessing. It's because of your mercy and grace that we are free from judgment. And, and I thank you, Dad. I thank you that when I don't measure up, you stand with me and testify with me that I am a child of the King. Thank you for reminding me of that. May we all find peace through our relationship with the Prince of Peace who calls us His children. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are heirs of the King. It's a great opportunity for us that God has given us to actively receive his grace. So if you're here this morning and you have never done that, our hope is, is that you would give your life to Christ. He is offering you something. All you need to do is actively receive it. And if you're here and you know that you are a child of the king adopted by grace, that the spirit testifies with you, then you will walk out of here rejoicing no matter what your situation in life. So today, praise the Lord. Amen. Have a good week in the Lord. Stay warm. Men, go warm up the cars.